So to start off with, let's have a look at what we're going to deal with. There are quite a number of topics that we have in this area, and the first thing we're going to do is define what probability is. Then we're going to look at how probability is expressed. Uh, we'll look at some terminology so that you know the kinds of terms that we use when we're speaking of probability. We'll also look at what is statistical probability versus theoretical probability. And of course, we'll have to do a number of examples uh, so that you can get your hands uh, onto doing some of the work that is required. Um, then we'll cover the probability associated with recurring outcomes or outcomes that happen time after time. Uh, and lastly, we'll do something called tree diagrams. We'll see what those are in a moment. Now, to define probability. Probability is that branch of mathematics that deals with the idea of chance. Uh, and, you know, if people speak in language, they say things like, oh, there's probably about a 50% chance that it's going to rain today, or I have a 10% chance of uh, winning that competition. Well, how do they know that they have a 10% chance or a 20% chance or whatever the percentage is? How do they work it out? Is there a way of working it out? Well, probability does deal with this exact question. And we're going to see how we can mathematically work out what the chances are of things happening. Particularly, uh, the branch of mathematics is used in things like predicting the weather. The weather is always associated with a chance relationship. You'll see when, if you watch television and you're looking at the news and maybe the weather comes on afterwards, you'll, say that there's a 60 you'll see that they'll say there's a 60% chance of rain or 30% chance of rain. Uh, and how do they know these, these values? Well, they've actually done some mathematical models to work out what the chances are of whether it's going to be a certain kind of weather at any time. So, the, the, the weather industry uses it, uh, then also the insurance industry, because they're working with chance all the time. They want to know, for example, what are the chances of someone who's maybe 30 years of age, who's just got their license and had it for three years, having a car accident? Because based on those chances, they will then set up an insurance premium for people who want to take out insurance against car accidents. And the insurance industry in South Africa is quite a large industry and relies heavily on chance or probability uh, being accurately expressed mathematically. And they'll pay people who, who do mathematical work on, on chance or probability, they'll pay them a lot of money so that they can get a good reflection of what the chances are that certain events will happen. And of course, chance is probably most easily expressed in the gambling industry, where the games of chance that are being played uh, are also mathematically calculated so that the, the casinos and the people who are operating them want to know exactly how much money they're going to end up getting out of the people who play those games uh, based on the chances of them winning those games. It would be a disaster for any casino if the chances of winning were far better than the chance of the, of the casino actually making money. Of course, that never really happens in real life because, again, they have chosen probabilities for these games in such a way mathematically that they know that they're almost guaranteed to win just every single time. So let's have a quick look at how we're going to express our probability. You'll see we have a nice straight line here. And if I put on the one side of the line, let's just draw a line here. And let's say we've got a zero chance of winning over here. And on this side, we have a 100% chance of winning. See, this is the scope of what probability uh, will use. If I've got a zero chance of winning something, it means it's impossible. I'll never win it, okay? There's just 0% chance of winning that thing. So let's write here, impossible.
Well, then what would we write on the other side? Because if something is 100% sure and I know it's going to happen, and I've got a 100% chance of maybe uh, winning that iPad in that next competition, whatever it is, what would happen? Uh, what would we call that? Well, a 100% chance we'll call a certainty. So anything in between that, in between impossible and a certainty, uh, we can express as some kind of figure. Notice we couldn't go beyond the zero. We can't have something that is less than impossible, okay, or more impossible for want of a better term. That doesn't make sense. If something's impossible, that's all there is to it. It's impossible. So zero percent or zero is our bottom limit when we're discussing probability. By the same token, we can't have something that's more than 100% possibility of being uh, one. If something is certain, that's all there is to it. It can't be more certain. So it couldn't have 120%, for example, of winning something. That's just never going to happen. So when we're talking in percentage terms, of course, we'll use the values 0 to 100. If we go on to the next explanation. It says when we talk about the chance of something occurring, we usually talk about the percentage. That's what we've been saying earlier on, chance of something occurring. That's what I said earlier, 50% chance of something happening, 20% chance of something happening. But we really have three mathematical ways of expressing probability. So the first one, we've already seen, that's the percentage. We're also going to express it as a decimal. And we'll have a look at that in a moment. And then lastly, another way that we're going to see probability uh, very often is as a fraction. Remember, a fraction is written as two numbers over each other. Something, for example, like a quarter. And then just to give you an idea of a decimal, let's put 0 0.5. So these three ways uh, or methods of uh, describing probability are all going to be used almost interchangeably uh, in your examinations. Just as a point of, of noting here, uh, you can actually use either of them or all three of them uh, when you're expressing probability in your answers. You can leave it as a percentage, you can express it as a decimal, and you can express it as a fraction. Just going back to that page where I drew the line, uh, let's just go and have a quick look there. We had the percentages 0 to 100 on our line. If we were to use a decimal, then we would have a value between 0 and 1. So as a decimal, 0 would mean an impossibility, and 1, a value of 1, would be a certainty. Any value in between, something for example like 0 0.1 or 0 0.2, would express a certain percentage of probability. Lastly, as a fraction, and we can also do this, uh, we can just put fractions here, 0 over any number, let's take 4 for example, 0 over 4 would express a 0 probability or an impossibility again. And lastly then, uh, as a fraction on this side, we could have 4 over 4. And 4 over 4 would simply be a certainty because that would express a whole or a 1 again. So either of these values uh, can be used on our continuity line uh, from 0 to 1 or 0 to 100 percent. And there we've just got our answers. You can see the limits of the numbers in probability are as follows. As a percentage, let's just fill them in, 0 to 100 percent. You cannot have less than 0% and you cannot have more than 100% when speaking of probability. As a decimal, the values are 0 to 1. And then lastly, as fractions, well, you could choose any fraction and you could say 0 over, let's make it 10 this time, and uh, that would then go to 10 out of 10. 
Again, you couldn't have something that said 11 out of 10, for example, as a fraction, because that would be something that would fall outside of the range of probability. Right, so let's have a, t a quick look at some terminology now. There are words that you're often going to hear when being uh, taught about probability. And the first one is the word an event. Now it says here, an event refers to something that can take place. Well, I'm sure you've heard this word in English before. An event can be anything that happens. When we talk about probability, uh, we could use an example. For example, uh, tossing a coin. If I get, took a coin out and I threw it over here, that would be an event. I'd say, I'm going to throw a coin. And we could let that event happen once, maybe twice, or even ten times in a row, and we could see what happens. So the event is the, the actual occurrence of something, and then the outcome refers to the possible results of any event. So looking back at my coin, if I took my coin, what are the possible things that could happen if I throw that coin? Well, the coin could either land on heads or tails. I'm sure you'll agree that for the coin to land on its side, and I usually get this question in my classroom, what if the coin doesn't land on heads or tails? Well, again, the probability of that happening would probably be very close to zero or impossible. Just given a fair coin, we'd expect it to land on either a heads or a tails. So the event is the throwing of the coin. The outcome of that event is would it land on heads or would it land on tails? Here again, just to recap, an outcome that has a 100% chance of occurring is known as a certainty. And an outcome that has a 0% chance of occurring is known as an impossibility. So if I was throwing my coin, and say I had a coin that had two heads, well, what would be the probability of that coin landing on heads? Well, throwing the coin, it has heads on both sides. So it's always going to land on either heads or heads. So it's a certainty that that thing will land on heads. What if I then said to you, well, then what's the probability of this coin that has two heads on either side landing on tails? Well, there are no tails on either side of the coin, so it would be an impossibility for that coin to actually land on tails. And, of course, if you are playing a coin game and the other person didn't know that this was a two heads coins and you called heads every time and you kept winning, they might start getting a little suspicious and want to see the coin. Because you're almost certain of, or you are certain of winning every single time and they're certain of losing every time or it's impossible for them to win because they're calling tails and there are no tails on that coin. All right, so let's have a look quickly now at statistical versus theoretical probability. And then we'll get into some examples just after that. Now, statistical probability refers to the experiment being done and to seeing the number of outcomes that occur for a specific set of events. Let's start with our coin probability again. If I took a coin here and I said to you, and you can go and do this example at home, Take the coin and throw it 50 times. And each time you do, record what comes up. Well, let's start off. We throw the coin. Let's say it came up heads. Then I'd mark on my page. I'd say, right, we've got heads. Next time I throw it, it comes up tails. Next time, tails. And so we go on. Tails, then heads, then heads, then tails, then tails, tails. And we do this 50 times. At the end of the experiment, we'd say we've thrown the coin 50 times. And we'd want to say, well, how many times did it come up heads and how many times did it come up tails? Let's say, for example, it came up 26 times heads and 24 times tails. That would mean that statistically, this coin lands 26 out of 50 times it lands on heads and 24 out of 50 times, it lands on tails. If I wanted to, I could turn this into a percentage simply by multiplying the two numbers by 2, because uh, that would give me something out of 100. And remember, a percentage is something out of 100. So that would be 52% of the time 
it came out heads, and 48% it came out tails. This would be the result of my experiment. I could go and throw that coin again and maybe do it another 50 times and keep measuring and see if my, my probability remains the same. Uh, the chances are that it probably will or be quite similar. But let's have a look at this other word now, which is theoretical probability. Now, theoretical probability lists the possible outcomes of any event and assigns a likelihood of the outcomes for each event. So what we're saying over there is again, let's use our coin because that's a nice simple example. If I throw the coin, what are the possible outcomes for the coin? Well, it's heads and tails. There's only two possible outcomes for this coin, so we can only have heads or tails. Now, there are two events that could take place. I could throw the coin and I could get one of them could be heads, one of them as an outcome of tails. So that means that one out of two possibilities exists for heads and another one out of two possibilities exists for tails. For the outcome to be heads, I have two choices for that event. It can be heads or tails. And for the outcome to be tails, I also have two choices, heads or tails. So the probability here is one out of two for each of those, or if I write it as a percentage, 50% in each case. Now, you can see that the statistical versus the theoretical in this case were different. Remember, my statistical probability of getting heads turned out to be 52%. For tails, it was 48%. Just something as a matter of point here is notice that both of these must always add up to the 100%. Something has gone wrong if you don't get 100% for the total. But since these two values are different, does that mean that I have a different probability for this coin? Well, yes and no. Theoretically, we can see the coin must land on 50% of the times heads and 50% tails. But in real life, that doesn't always happen. That's why with that experiment, I was testing the coin to see what it would do. And I can see that this coin actually lands 52% of the time on heads and only 48% of the time on tails. Let's use just another example to explain why this is important to do. If I took a dice, a little cube with numbers on it, one, two, three, and you know on the other side is four, five, and six. Now, throwing a dice, what are the probabilities of the dice landing on any specific number? Well, there are six possibilities. The dice can land on one, two, three, four, five, or six. And again, theoretically, I would expect all of those to be equal. So I would take 100% and I would divide it by 6 to find the probability of each one. And of course, if we do that, let's just do that on a calculator quickly. 100%, uh, because that's for all the events to happen, we'll divide that by 6. And we get an answer of 50 over 3, or a decimal of 16.6 uh, as a percentage. Uh, or if we wanted to make that as a decimal, we'd have to divide by 100 again. An answer of 1 sixth as a fraction, or as a decimal, as 0.166. So let's put that quickly on our sheet here. So there is a 1 sixth chance of this dice landing on a 1. And there's a 1 sixth chance of it landing on 2, 3, 4, 5, or 6. If I add all of those up again, they must come out to 100% or 6 sixths or 1, using my different uh, expressions of probability. So the dice has a 0.166 decimal or 16.6% chance of landing on any one of those six numbers. That's the theoretical possibility. But what if I threw the dice now and I did an experiment and I calculated the statistical probability and I found out the following? One, two, three, four, five, six. What if I found out, and let's say we did this and we threw the dice 100 times, and I found out that, okay, for one it came out 16, for two it came out 17, 
For three, it came out 16. For four, it came out five times. For five, it came out, uh, let's make it 20 times. And if we add up these numbers, we get 20 plus five is 25, plus 16 makes it 36. 46 and 7, uh, that gives you 53. 63 and 6 gives you um, uh, 69. That means at the end here, you've got a value of 31 for the 6. You can see that this dice doesn't seem to be working like it should. I should have a fair chance of landing on the same numbers in a hundred throws. It should be around 16 or 17 for all of them. But in this case, it wasn't. The six seems to land many, many more times than the other. Well, if a factory was making dice or die, uh, or, uh, a die, and it was wanting to test that die to see if it was a fair dice. It would throw a hundred times, maybe a thousand, maybe even a ten thousand times. And they'd usually get a machine to do this, not a person. But if the dice came out with a very high number for one certain number, that dice would be considered loaded or unfair. And so they'd have to test, and casinos are very particular about this when they get dice for their games. They want to make sure those dice are going to land fairly because the last thing they want to be accused of is cheating people. So they would need fair dice. So that would mean that the statistical probability must measure very closely to the theoretical probability for that dice to be allowed to go and be used in a casino. A dice that ended up doing what this dice did in our statistical experiment would certainly not pass the test for quality and would be considered a loaded dice or an unfair dice. Can you see how statistical probability does not necessarily mirror what should happen theoretically and it is only in doing a statistical experiment that we can determine whether the theoretical probability is correct for, for that event to occur. And if the, th the statistical probability is incorrect compared to the theoretical probability that we would expect, we would need to go back and ask the question why, or say something like, for example, in the dice experiment, that dice is not a fair dice. Something has gone wrong with it. It is weighted towards one side. And then we'd have to discard that dice and throw it away. Great, we're going to take a short break at this stage and then we'll be back in a moment. So go and get yourself something to eat or drink, uh, relax for a few moments, and then we'll continue this session. Well, welcome back. I hope you had a good break uh, and got yourself some refreshment. We're going to continue the session on probability. This is now section two. And we're going to start off with some examples. Uh, so let's go straight to example number one. Example one here says, if a coin is tossed, describe the theoretical probability of it landing on heads. All right, this is a nice easy one to get us going. So we know we're going to toss a coin, that's our event. What are the possibilities for the coin? Well, it can either land on heads or tails. That means we have two possible outcomes. So with two possible outcomes, what is the probability of one of those events occurring? The one event that we're looking at is heads. So heads could happen one out of every two times. And by the same token, tails can happen one out of every two times. So to answer the question, you could simply go and write, it's one out of two. That's a fraction. So we could write 1 out of 2, or if we wanted to convert that to a percentage, what is 1 out of 2 as a percentage? Well, for that to happen, we have to make our number out of 100. To convert 2 to 100, I'll have to times by 50, and do the same on top. So that would mean 50%. Lastly, I may have given you and asked you the question, uh, write that as a decimal, uh, and to write a percentage as a decimal, decimal, we simply uh, divide by 100, and that would be 0, 0,5. So any of those three answers would be a perfect answer for the question. Either a half, or 50%, or 0 0.5. All of those express the probability of the event of the coin landing on heads. Let's move on. This question says, describe an experiment to assess the statistical probability of tossing a coin. 
So we want to do a statistical experiment. So what do we need to do to set up an experiment? Well, for that experiment, we could say something like this. Take a coin and toss it 100 times. This is an experiment that we can do. And then measure the number of times the coin lands on heads or tails. So here we're setting up that experiment that we spoke about a little bit earlier, and we're testing the coin to see how many times it lands on heads or tails. Just a quick uh, question here. How do you think that statistical probability would measure up to the real possibility if you assume that the coin is fair? Well, the more times you throw the coin, 100 times, 200 times, 500 times, you'd probably find the closer you'd get to that 50% theoretical probability that you calculated earlier. You know, if I threw the coin 10 times, for example, and uh, we could actually go and do that experiment, we might get something like this. Heads, 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 tails, tails, heads, heads, tails, four, five, six, seven, eight, and one more. Let's do it like that. That might be a 10-time throw. And you'll see what we got here was one, two, three, four, five, six, seven heads. So seven out of 10 times it landed on heads, and three times out of 10 it landed on tails. And you might assume from throwing the coin 10 times that this coin is not a fair coin because it's 70% it's landing on heads, but only 30% it's landing on tails. But as you continue the experiment and you do it 20 and 30 and 100 and maybe two or 300 times or even 1,000, I know that seems like a long experiment, but you could maybe break it up into your class and try it and see if this works. You'd find that it would get closer and closer to a 50% chance. Uh, or, or what the theoretical probability actually states, uh, one out of two times. Go and do it as an experiment. It's really worthwhile uh, doing that to see if it works. Let's have a look now at question number two, or example number two. And it says, in the throwing of a fair die, what is the probability of getting a six? Well, we know that a die has six sides, and we can get the values one, two, three, four, five, or six. So there are six possible outcomes for this event of throwing the dice. What would be the probability of one of those events happening? Well, for each one of them, it's a one out of six possibility. So we could get one out of six chance of getting a one, a one out of six chance of getting a two, and a three, and a four, and a five, and a six, all the way through. You see, we couldn't, there no, there no dice has a maybe a two and a two and leaves out another number. If you had such a dice, well then that number would have another probability of getting uh, that number being thrown. For example, if I had two twos on the dice and no one, and I asked you the same question, and I uh, said to you, what's the probability of getting a two? Well, there'd be two possible outcomes, because the dice has a two on two sides. So that it would be a two out of six probability of getting a two. But because the dice has just these one numbers, one, two, three, two, one, or one through to number six, uh, on each of the si or the faces of the dice, we can just say that it is one out of six probability. And of course, the number we were interested in this case was the six. So there we go, that's the six. So to answer our question, it is a one out of six probability. Again, we can convert it to decimal or to percentage, uh, to 16.6%. We saw that on the calculator earlier, or a 0 0.16 as a decimal. Now, let's have a look at the next one, because this is where it gets a little more interesting. The question reads, what is the probability of getting an even number? Well, looking at each of these probabilities, we can see that there's an even number here, the number 2, and then also the number 4, and of course the number 6 is an even number. So... There are six possible outcomes of throwing the dice, the values one to six, but three of those probabilities would result in an even number. 
So I can write the probability now as 3 out of 6, because 3 of the probabilities would actually give me my answer of an even number. So 3 out of 6 we can convert back down to a half, and of course a half means a 50% probability. So if that dice was fair, which they said it was, there is a 50% chance of landing on an even number. All right. Let's go a little bit further. And the next one, question C, says a number less than 3. So let's go back and see what are the probabilities of getting a number less than 3. Well, the two the numbers that actually meet that criteria is the number 1 and the number 2. Because 3 is the number we're not allowed to be above. And of course, the 3 is not less than 3, so we can't include it. So only numbers 1 and 2 would be valid answers or valid solutions in this case. So we'd be looking at two possibilities, the number 1 and 2, out of the six possibilities that we have of throwing the dice. So a 2 out of 6 probability is equal to a third if I break that fraction down. And again, if we want to write this, and we should know how to convert to decimal and to fraction, a third as a fraction, uh, sorry, as a decimal, is 1 divided by 3. Let's do that on the calculator. A 1 divided by 3 equals, and there's the decimal, 0.333. And if I wanted to do that as a, a, a percentage, I'm just going to multiply by 100. So let's just look at that answer as well. It's 33.3%. So let's fill those in here. It's 0.33 or 33.3%. So the chance of the dice landing on a number less than 3 or 1 or a 2 is a 33% chance or 33.3% 33 chance, 1 third or 0 0.33. And lastly here, we've got a Fourth part, part D, uh, the question comes in, what's the probability of getting a 7 with a dice? Well, the dice only goes up to the number 6. There's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, or 6. So the number 7 doesn't appear on any of the faces. That means that you could never get a 7. It doesn't matter how many times you throw the dice. You could throw and throw and throw. It will never land with a side showing a 7, which in this case means an impossibility or 0 or 0%. Zero there we go. It can never happen, or we could even say since the dice has 6 faces or 6 events, 0 out of 6 of those events would ever present uh, as landing on a 7. Does that make sense to you? Are you seeing how this is starting to work? How we are taking the possible events that we could have and looking at the actual events that we do have and using that to express a probability. Also, I'm hoping you're realizing that chance is not just any old number. It's a specific value that can be mathematically calculated, as we've seen. Let's go on to the next section now. So we've got example three coming up. <coughs> and now we're going to work with a standard pack of cards. Again, the questions in your exams will often like to use things like cards. Uh, and uh, so you need to be familiar with the card pack. Now, let's quickly run through what, uh, what, what is in a pack of cards. I'm sure you're familiar with the, the uh, terms hearts and spades, uh, as well as diamonds and clubs. These are what we call the four suits of a pack of cards. A standard pack of cards has 52 cards in it, and then an extra two cards are usually put into a pack, and those cards are called jokers. Usually when it comes to probability, we remove the jokers so that we just work with the 52 cards. Those 52 cards have four suits, the ace, uh, sorry, the diamonds, the clubs, the hearts, and the spades. Of those uh, suits, each suit has 13 cards in it. And those cards range in number from an ace to a 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. And then we have the jack, the queen, and the king, making up the 13 cards. Sometimes we refer to picture cards uh, when we're talking about cards. And uh, then we will be referring to the cards called the jack, the queen, and the king. 
At times, the ace is also included in the picture. So make sure you understand if the, if the pack has said picture cards, then they will tell you usually include the aces if they want to include those as the picture cards. So picture cards refer to jack, queen, and king, and sometimes the ace as well. And uh, then we can talk about the red and the black cards, because remember the diamond suit and the heart suit are red cards, and the club suit and the uh, um, spade suit are black cards. So when you have questions, you need to understand those terms, and we're going to use those terms in the question that we're going to look at now. So here's example three, and the question says, what are the chances of picking a red card from our pack? Well, we're starting off, we've got 52 cards. To know how, or to know what probability there is of picking a red card, we need to know how many red cards there are. Well, the two suits that represent red are hearts and diamond. That means we've got two suits uh, of 13 cards each. And 2 times 13 is 26. That means there are 26 red cards in our pack. So the chances of picking a red card would be 26 out of the whole pack of 52. All right, so yeah, we have a fraction, 26 out of 52. Again, your teacher would probably not give you full marks if you answered and left the answer in this form because they'd either want the expression as a percentage uh, as well or in a simpler fraction. And we always need to simplify our fractions to the lowest possible fraction that we can. Well, 26 and 52, uh, we actually have uh, the number 26 can go into 52. And do you know how many times it goes in? Yes, the answer is twice. So I can reduce this fraction to a 1 out of 2. Because I can divide by 26 on top, and I can divide on 26 at the bottom, and I get the answer 2 at the bottom. So it is a 1 out of 2 chance of picking a red card, or to express it as a percentage, 50%. This is a great way to leave your answer. Give the fraction as well as a percentage, and then there is no uncertainty in terms of your answer, and you probably get 100% uh, for that question. So moving on to the next part, part B, and here they said, what are the chances of picking a picture card? And they've actually told you what a picture card is. They've said it is going to be a jack, a queen, a king, or an ace. So we have any of those four cards can be picked. So we need to again determine how many cards in the pack will meet our criteria. Well, there is a jack, a queen, a king, and an ace for each of the suits, for the hearts, for the clubs, for the spades, and for the diamonds. So that means there are four suits that have four cards each within them that will meet our criteria in this question. So that means it's 4 times 4, which equals 16. So we have 16 cards that would be classed as picture cards in a pack of 52. So to express our probability here, we're going to say 16 out of 52. Again, you'll probably only get half the marks for the question if you leave it in this form. So let's reduce this fraction. Well, I'm going to start by dividing by 2, because I know that those are both even numbers, and 2 will go into them. So 16 divided by 2 is 8, and 52 divided by 2 is 26. I still have even numbers, so I could divide by 2 again and reduce this fraction a little further, and it'll be 4 out of 13. Now, 13 is a prime number, so that fraction is as simple as it can be. So, expressed as a fraction, the chance of picking a picture card is 4 out of 13. But most cases, we'd probably want the percentage. And to work out the percentage here, we'd need to go and work out the percentage on our calculator. So let's call up our calculator, and let's do a calculation uh, to see what 4 out of 13 is as a percentage. Well, you'll type 4 on your calculator and divide it by 13. That gives you the fraction, which you can see over there, which you can convert to decimal, 
and if they had asked you for a decimal, you could say 0 0.307, or if you wanted to round it off, 308. But to turn that into a percentage, I must take this answer and multiply it by 100. So we'll multiply by 100, and we get an answer of 30.769 And normally for percentage, it is safe to just put one decimal place and round off to one decimal place. So we'll answer this as 30.8%. Right. So the percentage here, let's just write it in, is 30.8%. Great, so there we have our percentage. So to answer the question, the chance of picking a picture card out of a pack of 52 cards is a 30.8% chance. All right. Now they love these card questions and they have so many possibilities with them. Uh, so we're going to look at a couple more. I'm going to do C now, which is picking a diamond card. All right, so for a diamond, uh, we need to know how many diamonds there are in the pack. And we said that there were four suits. Each suit has 13 cards, so that means that the diamond suit has 13 cards. That means we have a probability of 13 out of all the cards, so it's 13 out of 52. Again, we want to reduce this fraction, and let's go and check, does the number 13 go into 52? The answer is yes, it does. It goes in four times. So I'm going to divide by 13 and both sides, and I'm going to get a fraction of a quarter. Expressing that fraction again as a decimal is 0 0.25, or as a percentage, 25%. So the chance of picking a diamond card would be 25%. Now we're going to look at picking a number card of 2 to 9. So this is ignoring those picture cards that we had earlier. Remember in question B, we asked for a picture card and we found that there were 4 out of 13 or 30.8% 30 chance of picking a picture card. We want to know what are the chances of picking a non-picture card or a 2 to a 9. So that means there's a 2 to a 9. Let's count up quickly. There's a 2, a 3, a 4, a 5, a 6, a 7, a 8, and a 9. That means we have 8 cards. So 8 of the cards in any suit, how many suits are there? There are 4. So there are 8 times 4 cards. And that would be equal to 32. So 32 of the cards in the pack must be a number 2 to 9. So we've got 32 out of the total pack again, which is 52. Reducing that, uh, we've got 16, if we halve it again, out of 26, or 8 out of 13. So there are 8 out of 13 chances to pick a picture card, or sorry, a value card of 2 to 9. And again, if we want to work out the percentage, we can go to our calculator, and we'll say 8 divided by 13, that gives us... 0.61, or if we want it as a percentage, which is the usual way of leaving it, 61.5%. And let's just fill that in over here, 61.5%. Question E says, what's the chance of picking an ace? Well, how many aces are there in the pack? I'm sure you're getting the hang of this now and working with your cards. So here we go. How many aces? There are four. Four out of a total number of 52. That's two out of 26 or one out of 13. And again, I can turn that into my percentage. So one divided by 13. Uh, let's just clear that. 13. And we'll multiply it by 100 and express it as a number. 7.7%. 7.7%. And then the last one here says, what is the chance of picking the Queen of Hearts? Well, there is only one Queen of Hearts in the entire pack, so that means we've got one out of 52 chances. All right, and to calculate this percentage, uh, let's just go back to the calculator one more time. And 1 divided by 52 
is equivalent to, and we'll multiply that by 100, and that's 1.9%. Uh, so let's just close down there again. So this equals 1.9%. Now, before I close off these examples, I'd like to just show you something else uh, with regards to these. If I said to you uh, that we wanted to work out the percentage of the picture card, and let's just go back to that example, it was here number B, we found out that the picture card was 30.8%. So I'm just going to write that at the bottom here, just to show you something on how you can calculate things quite quickly. We said that the picture card was 30.8% chance of being picked. What if I then said to you, what is the chance of not picking a picture card? Well, remember that the whole pack makes up what percentage? That's right, 100%. So if the picture cards make up 30.8%, then the non-picture cards would make up, correct, 100% minus the 30.8 percent that would leave us with an answer of 69.2 percent so we can express the probability of one event and then express the event of that thing not happening by subtracting it from a hundred percent the two always would must add up remember when we said earlier for example with our dice all the probabilities have to add up to a hundred percent if they don't we haven't actually considered every option in our probability. So if I said to you that picking a picture card was 30.8% and then asked you what's the chance of not picking a picture card, you simply take the 100, subtract the 30.8% and then you'll find the chance of it not happening. So the chance of an event happening is 100 minus the chance of the event not happening. Does that make sense to you? Well, that would help you, for example, in our card questions. If you had one event and you had the opposite of that event, you could simply take the answer to your previous question. Of obviously, you'd hope that that answer was correct. But then you could subtract that percentage and find then the percentage for the event not happening. Great. We're going to take another short break, and then we'll be back to complete this section on probability. <laughs> And welcome back to the final session or section of this uh, probability course that we're on today. We're going to do one last example before we go on to the last section, just to see if you're on your toes uh, and that you've got this stuff under your belt. So look at example four here. Uh, and the question says, a bag contains three red balls, five blue balls, and four white balls. What is the probability of? And let's see if question A here it says of picking a ball. Well, since the only thing that is in the bag are balls, uh, picking a ball from the bag would be a correct, a certainty. It's got to happen. There's nothing else in the bag. So if I put my hand in the bag and I pick something, I'm going to pick a ball. I don't know what color I'm going to get, but I'm not really interested at this stage in what color because the question only asked us if we want to pick a ball. So the answer is a very easy 100% chance. Or we could write something like this. We could say, what is the term for 100%? A certainty. It is going to happen. All right, so that was a nice easy one just to get you going. And let's go on to B here. The question is, what is the chance of picking a blue ball? Well, let's go back and see what we've got in our bag. So the bag's got three red balls, five blue balls, and four white balls. Well, to know what the probability is of picking a ball, we've got to know how many balls there are in the bag altogether. So we're going to add up the three plus the five plus the 4. Right, 3 plus 5 plus 4, that's not too difficult. If you need the calculator, use it. But we've got an answer here of 12. So there are 12 balls in the bag. How many of those balls are blue? There are 5 that are blue. So my probability would then be 5 possible outcomes out of a total of 12 outcomes. So there are 5 possible outcomes 
for the event of picking a ball out of the 12 that we have of picking any ball. So again, we'd want to express that as a percentage, and I'm going to use my calculator one more time. You can see we need the calculator quite often for these questions. 5 out of 12 is 5 divided by 12, and we'll multiply by 100 one more time, and turn that into a decimal or number, 41.6%, or if I'm going to round that, or 41.7%. So to answer my question, 41.7% chance of picking a blue ball from this bag which has 12 balls in it. Lastly, or sorry, next, a red ball. Okay, let's go and have a look at how many red balls there are in the bag. There are three red balls. Again, we know that there are 12 balls altogether, so I'm simply going to write this as 3 out of 12. Reducing that fraction comes out to a quarter, and a quarter, if I want to write it as a percentage or a number, is 0 0.25 or 25%. And the last one here says, what about picking a green ball? Well, there were no green balls in the bag. So no matter how many times I stick my hand into that bag and pick a ball, it's never going to be a green one. So the answer for this one is 0% or an impossibility. It can't happen. And there we have the examples on probability. Well, that's just to get you going. We're going to move on to the last little section, and we're going to talk about recurring outcomes. Sometimes we might be interested in the probability of an event recurring repeatedly. An example would be throwing the coin twice and asking this question. What is the probability of the coin landing on heads twice in a row? Well, let's move a little bit further down. Now, for the event one, okay, throwing the coin, what are the two possibilities that could happen? Well, the coin could land heads or tails. And then when I throw that coin again, it can land heads or tails. Now, if you remember from when we started with our coin experiment, we said that the possibility of this happening is 50%. So doing the event once, there's a 50% chance of it happening. Doing it again, there's another 50% chance of it happening. Does that mean that there would be a 100% chance of doing the event twice in a row for it to land on heads. Well, I'm sure you can see that that's not true. If I throw a coin twice and I want it to land on heads twice in a row, that's not necessarily going to happen 100% of the times. It's not going to be certain. Just because I threw the coin twice doesn't mean it will land on heads twice in a row. So we can see that we can't add these probabilities together if we're going to answer this question. So how then do we calculate the probability of this event happening for, for, for it twice in a row? You see, we're not just interested in how many times it's going to land on heads. We want to get heads this time in both throws. So the coin must land heads, heads. And I want to know what's the probability of that happening. We call that a recurring event. Let's have a look at how this happens. I'm going to do it by introducing another term for you, and that term is tree diagrams. The situation of successive events can be represented in a diagram known as a tree diagram. And uh, let's just ignore this example for a moment. We'll come back to it, but I'm going to go back to our coin example to show you how a tree diagram works. You see, the first event was heads and tails. Now, for the second event, it depends on the first event because we're only interested in getting a heads here, but then when we throw the coin again, that means that we can either get another heads or tails. In the same way, if we threw tails the first time, we could now also get a heads or tails in our next throw. So for the two throws, if I look at them, I could get 
a heads heads possibility the coin could first land on heads and then second land on heads then it could land first time on heads but second time on tails or it could have landed first time on tails and second time on heads or lastly it could have landed the first time on tails and the second time on tails so in actual fact we end up with four possibilities of what can happen with a recurring event here of throwing the coin twice either heads 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 tails tails heads or tails tails so with four possibilities what was the outcome I was interested in the outcome I wanted was heads heads that's what I was looking for and that occurred how many times well only once so only one of the four possibilities would be a heads heads situation in terms of the numbers that means 25 percent now we said there was a 50 percent chance of one event happening each time how can I use those numbers to get to 25 percent well some of you are saying well I could divide it by two because there were two events well that would be a good thing to, to say and you would be right but would that work every time well that's why I'm going to go on to the next example and we're going to see what happens so let's go and look at this question with the tree diagrams and uh, this one says take the example of a four-sided dice now that would be a triangular shape, something like a pyramid, uh, that has the numbers 1 to 4 on it. And we're going to throw this dice three times. Let's see how that would look in a tree diagram. It's three events, because we're going to throw the dice three times. Event 1, event 2, and event 3. So what are the numbers that we can get from event 1? There are four numbers, 1 to 4. So I could get a 1, a 2, a 3, or, let's make some more space, a 4. Now in event 2, if I threw a 1 the first time, and I'm throwing it now for the second time, I've still got a choice of 1 to 4 for every one of those examples that I got in my first event. So that means that the tree diagram is now going to do this. It's going to go 1, 2, 3, 4. And it's going to be the same for the 2. 1, 2, 3, 4. And for the 3. 1, 2, 3, 4. And lastly for the 4. We're running out of a bit of space here. But we also got 4 numbers there. And now when I throw that again, each of these examples can also be broken up into 1, 2, 3, and 4 because I'm doing a third event. So my tree diagram is getting quite big now. This one has got a 1, 2, 3, and a 4. So is this value, 1, 2, 3, and 4. I'm going to write it here, just 1, 2, 3, and 4. Can you see how my tree is branching out further and further as it's going? And literally, you can see, I've got four possibilities for event one, with four possibilities for every one of those events. That would mean four times four events for it happening again for event two. But each of those possibilities also have another four possibilities. So I'm going to multiply by four again. And that gives me an answer of 64 possibilities occurring from my tree diagram of throwing the dice three times. To go back to our coin example, let's just go and extend the page and see what happens with that tree diagram if we add another event to it. Now, we started off with event one, which had a heads or tails, and then we said we wanted an event two, which also has heads or tails. And then we're going to add, let's just add one more. So we're going to go heads or tails for each of these events. Now, if I asked you the question for three recurring events, and I asked you what would be the chance of this coin landing heads three times in a row? Well, that would be this branch here. That would give us a heads 
heads, heads. But that would happen only one time. Out of how many possibilities? Because I've got a heads, heads, tails over here, and a heads, tails, heads, and a heads, tails, tails, and so on and so on. Well, that means we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight possibilities occurring. And the chance of landing heads, heads, heads would happen one out of eight times. Now remember, let's go back. We said that each event happens 50% chance of it, of it occurring. Because there's always a 50% chance of the coin landing on heads or tails. Now I asked you earlier, if it was 50%, could we add them together? And we saw that we couldn't. Because that would give us 100% for two events, and that certainly wasn't true. Then we said, well, there was one out of four events, which was 25%. Could we divide it by two? And we said, well, 50 divided by 2 is 25, so that looks like it could work. But in this case, we now have three 50%. So do we take the chance and say 50% divided by 3 to work out if the coin can land three times on heads? Well, that would mean that 50 divided by 3 would have to equal 1 out of 8, because that's what we saw over there. If I look on my calculator, and let's just go and do that, 1 out of 8 as a number or decimal is equivalent to 0.125. Is 50 divided by 3 also equal to that number? Well, let's check. Well, that's 16.6. Okay, if I divide that by 100 because I want it as a decimal, the answer is... 0.16. It's not 0.125, which is what we need it to be. So we can see that we also cannot take the percentage of the event happening and divide it by the number of times it's happening. So how do we use these 50% to get to the point where we get this answer of 1 out of 8? Well, let me show you. What we've actually got to do is take each event and its percentage of it occurring, and multiply it together. Let's go and use our calculator and see if that comes out to our 0.125. Well, 50% is 0.5, so I'm going to multiply by another 0.5, and then I'm going to multiply by another 0.5. And if you look at that, the fraction comes out correct as 1 out of 8, which of course as a decimal is 0.125. So to calculate the probability of recurring events happening, we have to take the percentage of the event happening, or the outcome coming or happening, and multiply it for each of the times that that outcome occurs. In our coin example that we've just used, we said that we wanted now uh, three times for heads. Let, here it is. We wanted three heads in a row. Each head probability is a 50% chance of happening, so we multiply 50% by 50% by 50%, and we get the 1 out of 8 times that that event can happen. And that came out as 12.5%. I'm going to do another example of this, and we're going to look at an example to see how this will occur for, for a different result. Let's move on from our tree diagram and have a look at this one that we did with the dice. We said that we had four numbers. Okay, so let's just quickly draw a, a quick representation of our tree diagram once more. I'm not going to draw the whole thing because that will take far too much time. But remember, it was a one, two, three, or four. Then each of those had one, two, three, or four. And each of those themselves had one, two, three, or four. So what is the chance of throwing three ones in a row? Well, the chance of getting a 1 for my first event would be 1 out of 4, or 25%. For the second one, again, it would be a 25% chance to throw a 1. And for the third one, it would be a 25% chance. Now, how do I work out the probability of getting those three ones in a row? Yes, I have to multiply each of the probabilities. So I'm going to take the values and I'm going to multiply them, and for this we definitely need to use the decimals. So turning 25% into a decimal 
is 0.25 or 0 0.25. We multiply that by 0.25 and then we'll have to multiply it again by 0.25. And we see that for this case, there is a 1 out of 64 chance of this event occurring. Remember, when we did our tree diagram, we saw that there were 64 possibilities. The possibility of getting three ones in a row, however, is only one out of those 64 possibilities. And so again, we can see that as a decimal as 0 0.01, or if we want it as a percentage, times it by 100, and the answer is 1.5%. Now to finish off, I'm going to return one more time to that coin probability picture. And if I threw heads and tails, then for my second event, I could have heads and tails and heads and tails. And what if I asked you this question? And I said to you, what is the probability of the coin landing on heads for one throw and tails for the other throw? Now, here the order wouldn't matter. If it had heads first and tails the next time, that's fine. We don't mind which way it goes. It could be tails first and heads first. Or, or hit second the next time. So that would mean I'd be interested in the branch, not the one that goes heads, heads, because that one is two heads. Here we want heads, tails, that one we are interested in. This one we're also interested in tails, heads, because that's one of each, but we're not interested in this last one, which is tails, tails. So the two probabilities that I would be interested in, or two events, are those two. Well, we know that there's a 50% chance of this happening and a 50% chance of each of these ones happening. So to work out the combined probability again, we multiply those two things and 50% times 50% would give us a 1 out of 4 or a 25% chance. Remember we did that earlier. But that means that there's 25% chance of this event and 25% chance of that one, 25 of this one, and lastly, 25% chance of that happening. Again, it's four events. Four times 25 is 100, so we know we've covered every possibility. And we have two events that meet the criteria of having one tails and one heads. So what do we do with these two probabilities? Each one has a 25% chance of happening. And because there are two that meet our criteria, here we do add the two probabilities together. So we could say that there is 25% chance of the one event plus another 25% chance of the other event. And so there would be a 50% chance of the coin landing on either tails or heads or one of each in those two successive throws. So notice how here at the end, because there are two different probabilities on our tree diagram that meet the criteria, we can add those two probabilities together. But to get the probability of an event happening recur, uh, recur, uh, recursively, uh, we have to take the two probabilities of each event or the probability of each event happening and multiply it by the event of that hap event happening again. That gives us that 25% idea over there. If we have a look at some exercises, let's just quickly do one or two examples. So here's question number one. Uh, we're just going to do this last example before we finish the session. And it says, calculate the probability of picking a girl from a class of 12 girls and 14 boys. Well, to pick a girl, we know there's 12 girls. But from the classroom, we have to know how many people there are altogether. Well, there's 12 plus 14. That means there's 26 people altogether. So 12 out of 26, we don't want to leave it like that. Remember, we have to redu reduce our fraction. That would be 6 out of 13. And again, the fraction is not always the best representation. A percentage would be better. So let's go to the calculator. 6 divided by 13 is equal to 0.46 and multiplying that by 100 to get our percentage we have an answer of 46.15 percent so let's fill that in over here or 46.2 percent 
if we round off to one decimal place, which is what we usually expect. I hope you've learned something about probability and that chance really isn't uh, the haphazard guesswork that some of us think that it is. It has mathematical principles behind it as we've seen in this session on probability. Enjoy your day further and all the best with those exams. <laughs>